So Brian gave you his subliminal messages in his view against biosimilars, and I will give you my attempt at uh, subliminal in, uh, in favor of them. Um, because I think you should realize that we've taken opposite views of what our natural states are. Primo Levi said, in a chemist's work, you must not trust the almost the same. The differences may be small, but can lead to radically diverse results. You've already heard that biosimilars are not generics. They are not identical. They are similar to the greatest extent that the, um, in, not the innovator, but the new company it, can possibly make it. The protein structure, as you've heard, is the same, but the post-translational carboxylation, all of the sugars around it, as Brian mentioned, uh, depend on a great deal of factors. So the originator is not exactly the same as the biosimilar. While the protein structure is, the carboxylation is not necessarily identical. It's similar, but not identical. The development of biosimilars is actually opposite of the innovators, and I'm not showing a triangle um, along those lines, but the originators, the majority of the work and the majority of the cost of the development relates to the controlled clinical trials. The opposite is the same for the biosimilar. In a biosimilar, the majority of the costs are the analytics in order to make the compound as close as humanly possible to the originator. There are literally dozens or probably a hundred different analytic assays needed to uh, assess the biosimilar's similarity to the originator. And as David mentioned, is one of the issues is you can't make it better. If you make a biosimilar work better than the originator, it's actually a new drug and has to go through all of the clinical development. So the majority of the effort is in the analytics. And the question is, which of the analytics are important? If you get 99 out of 100 very similar, very, very close, is that adequate? Is one analytic somewhat different? So the question is, are they all important? are equally relevant. And what if one is different? For instance, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. And Brian already mentioned this. With the biosimilar to infliximab, there are some minor changes and minor differences in the sugar structure called fucosylation that may impact on antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity if you think that this is important. Brian's already mentioned, and showing a, sim a biosimilar slide, I would guess, um, to mechanisms of action in anti-TNFs. And he's already alluded to some differences. They may not be as different as a chimeric and a human antibody, but when you pegylate or when you use an antibody fragment, are the results exactly the same clinically? And he gave the example of etanercept when they're not. And we need to assess whether sertoluzumab's clinical efficacy is the same as um, that of adalumumab or um, infliximab or golumumab. Despite these differences, um, they may not have exactly the same properties. And indeed, in the biosimilar development, as I mentioned, the bottom part of the triangle is where most of the effort is. If we wanted biosimilars to follow the exact same pathway, the cost reduction that Brian alluded to would not be present. If we had to do controlled clinical trials for every indication for a biosimilar that the originator had, there would be no value in developing biosimilars. Yet there are some important clinical data that are necessary in order to demonstrate the safety, emphasize safety, and efficacy of the biosimilar compared to the innovator. Now, the differences in these agents may impact on the sample size necessary, and what are the validated endpoints used? If we did a biosimilar study now with Crohn's disease, we would need to use the same endpoints used for the original originator, 
which in, with infliximab was a 70-point reduction in the Crohn's disease activity index. I will tell you, since the introduction of infliximab in 1998, as you're all aware in sitting and listening to therapeutic drug monitoring, the questions have changed. We no longer really care about a 70-point reduction in the CDAI. But if there were to be a biosimilar study comparing to uh, infliximab, it would be using the same endpoints used that the originator used to gain market uh, approval. And as Brian emphasized, immunogenicity is going to be one of the major issues to be, uh, between biosimilars and the originator. And as you've already heard, uh, immunogenicity is an important aspect and requires multiple switches in order to confirm that there are not going to be any differences. Now, the Pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics are increasingly important. We ignored them for the first decade of biologics. But now that we have learned about therapeutic drug mo mo monitoring from the majority of the agents, we're finding that this is important. And we've learned that studies, the pharmacokinetics in rheumatoid arthritis are not the same as the pharmacokinetics in a patient with bad ulcerative colitis who's losing the protein as well as the monoclonal antibody into the feces. This more rapid elimination leads to a more rapid drop in blood, in blood levels, and uh, the absence of drug in the blood leads to antibody development. David's already suggested three important terms, the uh, switching, interchangeability, and automatic substitution that need to be monitored once a biosimilar makes it to the market. And as I've already mentioned, the uh, clinical endpoints for phase three studies are no longer the same in 2015 and 16 as they were in 1998. The FDA is revoking confidence in the Crohn's disease activity index. So if we had another trial, we wouldn't even know what the endpoints would be. Now, immunogenicity is really complex. Brian gave a wonderful introduction to it. But it's different in inflammatory bowel disease than it is in rheumatoid arthritis, where methotrexate is a background drug for all patients. So studies of immunogenicity in rheumatoid arthritis aren't going to reflect the potential immunogenicity in inflammatory bowel disease. Furthermore, the drug assays used to assess immunogenicity are different. There are a variety of different assays over years, and even with one compound, infliximab, looking at immunogenicity across a variety of different drug ass assays, the immunogenicity goes anywhere from 20% to 50% with the same drug, but using different drug assays. And there are numerous factors that impact on the immunogenicity, including glycosylation, which may be different between the similar and the originator. So changes in the manufacturing process and inadequate handling or storage can also affect it. And indeed, Brian's already alluded to the likelihood that the originators are biosimilars of themselves due to changes in manufacturing processes along the way. Additional factors include the route of administration, um, genetic factors, immunogenicity is genetic. Some individuals are more likely to respond to vaccines than others, and that's related to the underlying genetics. But much of immunogenicity is unknown. And although important factors have been identified, most determinants remain unknown to this point. So there are numerous critical issues, and Brian's alluded to most of them, including intermittent exposure between them. David's discussed the role of extrapolation. If a drug is a biosimilar is approved in rheumatoid arthritis, can it be extrapolated to inflammatory bowel disease? And this requires a variety of different studies that have been done in one disease set or another to allow extrapolation uh, to a second indication. These include transitioning, patients who have been on either drug or similar, and then transitioning to the alternative, substituting one, or back and forth uh, interchangeability between agents. Brian's already suggested that in his native country, 
the um, extrapolation to inflammatory bowel disease was not approved for the infliximab biosimilar, whereas in most other countries around the world, it has been accepted. So there are a number of different concerns, including the pathway is still a work in progress. We do not have final FDA uh, designation. The cost to conduct studies is extraordinary. And although Brian or David said that the pharmacist, you may say, do not substitute, okay, the pharmacist won't substitute, but who's going to pay? The third party payer is going to be the one who decides on that. So in conclusion, biosimilars can't be considered generics, as we've already heard, because immunogenicity is largely unpredictable. The assessment of a biosimilar must be based on a thorough risk-benefit assessment and robust post-marketing and risk management programs. Physicians and hospital pharmacists should remain alert to unexplained changes. And um, uh, let's go on. Can we get the next slide, please? My clicker's not doing it. Interchangeability is the most critical issue for patients and physicians that be, uh, bears careful monitoring. And obviously, more studies are desirable. So to conclude, Bill Tremaine told me this a number of years ago and quoted Gertrude Stein, that a difference to be a difference must make a difference. And I would ask you in 2015 if this is really bioequivalence or biosimilarity. Thank you.